why. It's a question asked a lot by commenters on this channel. People want to know why I replaced the 125cc engine in my Grom with the 250 when it would have been easier to just ride the 250. They want to know why I'm going to build an off-road Viper. They ask why I or anyone else would put a motorcycle engine in a car. Why do people choose to do these things? We choose to put motorcycle engines in cars and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because we did not have the foresight to know how hard they would be. Also, they just kind of seem like cool things to do. It's hard to explain, but if you're the kind of person to ask the W question, you're probably not going to understand anyway. Why put a motorcycle engine in a car? Why shoehorn a Kawasaki Ninja into the back of a Nissan Leaf? If you've driven it, then you'd know why. And me? I know why. I would have never guessed that a Nissan LEAF would be one of the most fun cars I've ever driven, but to be fair, this is only partly a LEAF. Most of the power comes from a Kawasaki ZX-10R, it also has parts from a 370Z, a Ford Mustang, a Lexus IS350, and a handful of laser cut and welded parts. It looks complicated, and it kind of is, but it also kind of isn't. If you want to put a motorcycle engine in a car, I always say that you should start with the lightest car you can. I always say you should pick a classic car that's cool on its own, and I always say you should keep it simple by changing as little as possible. This car was built by Derek Young, who took none of that advice, and still managed to make one of the most exciting custom cars I've ever driven. This is a 2013 Nissan LEAF. The LEAF was the best-selling electric car in the world for most of the last dozen years, but it's not particularly inspiring or much of a classic. This one had severe battery degradation, leaving it with only about 25 miles of range. This is a 2008 Kawasaki ZX-10R. It spent most of its life street racing around the Central Valley of California, getting abused and thrashed before finally getting into a wreck that ended its motorcycle career. Both of these vehicles alone are sad stories that normally would have ended in a junkyard. And then, along came a wizard. And by wizard, I mean mechanical engineer, which is basically a wizard. After some months of wizarding, which we will get into shortly, out came a 280 horsepower, 13,000 RPM plug-in hybrid. This seems wild, but it might be the perfect use of a Nissan LEAF and a sport bike. Leader bikes are insane. There is no reason anybody should be riding one of these things. I do get it. I've owned and ridden several sport bikes and other motorcycles. Pretty sure that I was invincible until my left leg was shattered by a member of the only group more recklessly stupid than sport bike riders, Ford Mustang drivers. No, the correct place for these engines is in cars. This is made easier by the fact that those sport bike riders are wildly out of touch with their own capabilities. Used motorcycle engines from wrecked bikes can be found all day long. Just wash off the blood and you're good to go. I have a motorcycle-powered car and I did briefly turn it into a hybrid. It was a fun project, but the motor was underpowered and it added too much weight for my small car. It made it worse. What I was trying to achieve is this. An electric motor powerful enough to drive the car around by itself for a few miles and a motorcycle engine to turn on when you want the fun to start. The controls on this car can be a bit confusing, but when you're just driving it around the neighborhood or parking lot, you leave the motorcycle in neutral and drive it around like a Nissan Leaf. When you want to get going, fire up the Kawasaki and dial in your level of fun. You don't even need a starter for the motorcycle engine. You can do that cool LMP hybrid thing where they bump start the engine with the electric motor. This is the mullet for the environmentally conscious hot rodder. EV in the front party in the back. Derek, the aforementioned wizard, took most of the motorcycle and grafted it into the trunk of the leaf. Normally a leaf does not have much structure in the back, nor axles or driven wheels. This problem was solved with the addition of parts from a third vehicle, a Lexus IS350, specifically the subframe. The subframe has the wheels, the brakes, and the axles. The engine has a sprocket. To connect the sprocket to the axles was the difficult part. The first problem is that the engine sits neatly above the axles, but the chain only really goes out the back. So the chain goes out the back to an idler sprocket, and then down and forward to the differential. The other side of the chain goes around a tensioner and back to the sprocket. The differential is from Quaif. They make differentials for this exact application. Not this exact application, but motorcycle engines in cars. The outputs for that diff are Honda tripods, but the subframe use CV joints from a Lexus. Simple enough. You just get the two axles, cut them in half, trim them to length, and weld a sleeve over them. This worked on my lightweight Honda, but Derek wanted the extra strength of real axles, so he sent his welded Frankenstein axle to Dutchman Axles, who made new ones using all the same geometry. Like most mechanical engineers, Derek is pretty comfortable designing things in CAD, so he scanned the car and motor and all the important stuff and designed all the mounting in SolidWorks. He mostly used my favorite fabrication tool, laser-cut two-dimensional parts from Send Cut Send. 
The ductwork is particularly cool. He just mounted the radiator in the car and then just scanned the window and the radiator using photogrammetry. Then he had a flat pattern laser cut out with perforations at the bends. The engine compartment is separated from the cabin with an acrylic window. This window shape was designed with a different kind of CAD, Cheerios aided design. The outside duct is a combination of 3D printed ABS parts and flat ABS sheet, making the whole thing relatively cheap for a large part. To get the air out the back of the radiator, a gurney flap was added to the liftgate to try to promote a low pressure area behind the car. So it goes fast, but it also corners and stops with the help of some sticky tires and upgraded brakes. The front calipers are from a 370Z. They fit neatly on the leaf upright. The rotors, however, came from a Ford Mustang. They fit the bolt pattern and the new calipers with the help of a 1mm shim. This is my kind of engineering, the old school hot rod way of finding a solution in the junkyard for 50 bucks rather than the aftermarket for 1000 Rear brakes are the stock brakes that just came with the IS350 subframe, and they're actually larger than the front brakes that came with the Leaf. Outside of purpose-built race cars, this might be the fastest accelerating Nissan Leaf in the world, and it's almost definitely the best at slowing down. With all those sad junkyard parts added together with the wizardry of engineering and fabrication, what you end up with is 280 horsepower of all-wheel drive that sound and drive like no other car in the world. How it drives is a great question, but first you have to figure out how to actually drive it. There are two completely independent powertrains, neither of which are designed to be team players. So at first it's a little confusing, but after a few minutes, you kind of get the hang of it. The first thing to note is that you can drive around in fully electric mode, just like a normal Nissan Leaf. You just leave the motorcycle engine in neutral. You can even have the engine running. The bike has a custom drive-by wire setup that's controlled with this dial here. With the dial all the way to the left, the throttle only controls the electric motor. So the engine can be idling and you can just drive around as though you're in a normal Nissan Leaf with a running motorcycle engine in the trunk. This makes it super easy to drive around parking lot. It's also the only reverse as the bike engine doesn't have that capability. You can leave the car in gear and drive it around electric only as long as you press in the clutch. So you're pressing both the clutch and the accelerator at the same time. It's a very unique left foot driving experience. When you move the dial up to the middle, you get equal throttle for both front electric and rear bike engine. So full throttle in the middle is just full power on both powertrains. As you turn the dial to the right, it sends less throttle to the EV motor, which just kind of biases your power to the rear. The dial also helps keep the battery charged and the temperature of the motorcycle engine down. If the engine is getting too hot, dial it down. If the battery charge is getting low, dial it up. The Leaf motor doesn't seem to care that it's being helped along with the screaming motorcycle engine, but you do have to remember to turn off the stability control nannies, otherwise they jump in randomly during aggressive driving. Like every good motorcycle engine car, this one has sequential shifting. To get the shift lever in the right place without disturbing the existing controls, Derek made a cool 4-bar linkage. This puts the shifter mechanism where the old coin tray was. On the front of the shift lever is a button that kills the engine, so you can just hammer up through the gears without lifting the throttle. You can also turn this off with this switch for a more relaxed driving experience. It is incredibly exciting to drive this in the canyons. I'm reluctant to say that it's better than my motorcycle-powered car, but that might just be my bias. It has that marvelous feeling of being directly connected to the ferocity of a sequentially shifted 13,000 RPM engine. The tires make it stick, the brakes make it stop, and the EV pulls it through the shifting, giving you front-wheel drive power all the time. Driving it to the canyons is definitely better than my car. You can dial in the power or dial back the noise to your comfort level. It has airbags and cup holders, and meanwhile, I'm over in my go-kart taking Tylenol by the handful. I'm jealous. I know I started this video off criticizing the W question, but I did ask Derek why he built this. Bike engine power car. It's awesome. I wanted the revs, I wanted the sequential gearbox, you know, the sound, the, like the fury. Oh, I understand that part, but why a Nissan Leaf? I didn't want to restore a vintage car, and because of my current workspace situation, I couldn't, I couldn't take on a project that big. So doing a converting an existing running EV to have a bike engine is actually kind of the simplest way to do it. Like, it seems crazy that this is the easiest way to do it, but in some ways it is. Yep, it's a subframe swap, which is a big deal, but that's it. No custom fuel tank, no custom oil pan, you know, no custom headers. The Leaf was the perfect platform to start with because they're cheap, readily available, and there's nothing back here. I sort of built it as like a prototype of what future enthusiast car might be. I would love to see a manufacturer build something like this, like not an NSX or an i8, but like a lightweight sporting car. Not that it's lightweight. It doesn't actually even have to be lightweight. It just needs to be cheap with a very small, very peaky, exciting engine. Yeah. 
with a robust EV drivetrain. This is probably the future of hot rodding. Hybrid cars can be tricky, as I found out the hard way, but full EV cars just don't have the excitement. The sound, the vibration, the visceral feel of the shifter. You can lap me in a plaid all day long, but I'd rather take this to a track than a Tesla 10 times out of 10. But it is still an EV. All of that stuff is still there to get you around the parking lots to the stores and back and crawling through traffic without the abrasiveness that comes with the excitement of internal combustion. It really is the best of both worlds. It's better than the best of both worlds. It's more than the sum of its internal combustion and EV parts. And all it takes is a few thousand dollars, a junkyard, a one-car garage, and the imagination of a wizard. What a time to be alive. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>